I was going to have that up here, but I realized that I still need my Bible and my book, so I'll, I'll be fine. I'll be okay. All right. Uh, before we begin, if you don't have a Bible, uh, the only excuse I can give you for not taking one to use right now is if you can't read. If you can read, I advise you to take one. It will really help you to follow along. And uh, for those uh, that, yes, thank you. The only reason I think it's good to get used to turning pages is because that's the only way you can uh, get used to finding your way around. As you turn the page, you know where to find it. And the time is coming when we're going to have to defend our faith. And the more you use this, the more you can navigate through it when you need to. So even though I've put a lot of the verses up here, I do like to hear turning pages because sometimes technology can fail you, but uh, this never runs out of battery. So if you wouldn't mind just bowing your heads, I, <clears throat> I will open with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, I come before you, Lord, humbly, seeking your presence, Lord, seeking your face, that you may shine upon us all today, Lord. What we are thirsting for is your spirit, O oh Lord. And Father, we just pray that as our faith is encouraged, as we see what is ahead, Lord, and commit ourselves to the cause, I pray, Lord, that you may empower us as you did the apostles after they had heard the word, they had been taught by Christ himself, Lord, and they needed the power from on high that the gospel could be carried to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. That is our longing this morning, we pray, O oh Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. We're going to um, take a little journey. And because we're only starting at 10 past, I know that my time is limited. So I'm going to speak as fast as I can. And I hope you can keep up because this is very, very important. Nadam and I have been praying and, and really working hard to put this together. So this is not my work alone. That's not even my slideshow. Uh, but we have definitely worked uh, through this together. And so this is only part one of three parts, so I pray that you may really uh, grab hold of uh, this foundation, that uh, the next parts may really make a lot of sense, because the time is at hand. That's what John says about the book of Revelation. He says, blessed is he that reads, and they that keep the words that are written in this book, for the time is at hand. And there never was a time when those words were more applicable than the times in which we live. Now, before I begin, I wanted to share this with you because I thought it is significant because it's very biblical. And I'm not setting dates, but maybe he might give a nod if you turn to him. Uncle Bill said this, okay? He said, the Lord revealed to him, okay, does anyone know who, not know who Uncle Bill is? <clears throat> if you look that end, there's only one person on a, a moped. He said that the Lord revealed to him that he would see Christ coming. Now that takes me to the time of Simeon, who God revealed to that he would see the Messiah. He would not die until he saw the Messiah. So I'll leave that with you to think about. All I'm saying is that we're living in the last days. And so we're going to begin in Revelation 12. Now this is the best summary the Bible gives of the whole picture. That's why I thought, given our time limits, we'll, we'll, we'll stick to Revelation 12 as our uh, outline and then uh, we'll go through some of these verses um, to make sense of it all. So Revelation 12 and from verses 1 to verse 
3. And this is what it says. I don't even know if I put it up there. No, I didn't. It says this in Revelation chapter 12. It says, And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And she, being with child, cried, travailing in birth, and pained to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven crowns upon his heads. Now, the woman, you're going to have to take my word for this, okay? The woman represents God's people, all right? Paul says that I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. In Isaiah 54, it says, thy maker is thy husband, speaking about God's people. Now she's clothed with the sun because the Bible speaks of the gospel as light. It says, the God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the faith in the face of Jesus Christ. We okay so far? And obviously the moon, so, you know, the, the relationship between the sun and the moon, one reflects the other. And so, as you know, the Old Testament and the New Testament are given in types and shadows. So the Old Testament foreshadows the New Testament. That's why it says, those things were written as shadows, but the body is of Christ. All right. Then you have this dragon with seven heads, ten horns. Now, <clears throat> you will notice if you've read this chapter and the chapter following that on the dragon, the crowns that he has are on his head. So the dragon has only seven crowns, and those crowns are on his heads. And the beast in Revelation 13 has ten crowns, and those crowns are on his horns, not on his heads. All right. So I'm going to read this passage because it gives an outline. And the format is it gives a picture and then it repeats the picture again with more detail within the same chapter. Okay. So I'm going to read on. It says, And his tail drew a third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born. And she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared of God. And there they would feed her a thousand two hundred and three score days or a thousand two hundred and sixty days. And there was war in heaven. Now, we get all the way to 1,260 days, and then now we're going back again, and now we're saying there was war in heaven, okay? And it says, Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels, and prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven, and the dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceives the whole world was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So we began, the dragon was seen in heaven. The woman was seen in heaven. And now the dragon was cast out of heaven down to earth. So if you were following, just in verse 4, the dragon had drawn a third part of the stars and cast them to the earth. So this was the first summary, saying, look, there was conflict between the dragon and the woman. And then the dragon ended up drawing a third part of the stars down to the earth. And then it fo follows on from there. And then it starts again and says, look, there was conflict in heaven. The dragon fought against Michael and his angels. And they were cast out. So it repeats the casting out just to give you a perspective that it's the same story repeated. And it goes on from there. And it says, and I heard a loud voice, I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ, 
For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. Therefore rejoice ye heavens and ye that dwell in them. Woe unto the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. For the devil has come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knows he has but a short time. And when the dragon saw that he was cast out to the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. And to the woman were given wings of an eagle that she might fly into the wilderness, where she had a place prepared, and there they would nourish her for a time at times and half a time from the face of the serpent." I hope you're seeing the repetition that the first time it said she fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared of God where they would feed her 1,260 days. And now it says it again and says, look, she went into the wilderness where she was nourished for a time, a times, and a dividing of time. Same picture within the same chapter, just repeated. All right. Now, I want you to hold on to the thought that the devil then came having great anger because he knew he had but a short time. Now we're going to unfold what we've just read so that it makes sense in the context of what the Bible says. It says, here is the mind that has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. So obviously, um, you have a further revelation in Revelation 17, but you still have seven heads Ten horns. So the first one is pertaining to the woman that rides the beast, all right? But this next one is the one that we want. It says, and they are seven kings. Five are fallen, one is, the other is not yet come, and when he comes, he must continue a short space. Now, I'm not going to get into the big details of, of this, but what I want you to see is that when the dragon has seven heads... And it gives a span of history of Satan warring against God's church right from the beginning all the way to the end of time, right? When it says kings, we're talking not about kings, but kingdoms. So if you read in the book of Daniel, it gives a good interpretation when it says these four beasts are four kings, and then it says they are kingdoms, all right? Now... Just so you know the context from a biblical perspective, right? The dragon here is seen with seven heads, and so he's using the kingdoms of the world to war against God's people, all right? And this is what the devil says, his own words. It says, and the devil taking Christ up, right, in the temptation in the wilderness, into a high mountain, showed unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, All this power will I give you, and the glory of all these kingdoms. For it is delivered to me, and to whomsoever I will, I will give it. If you will therefore worship me, it will be thine. Okay. So the picture given in Revelation 12 is this that the kingdoms of the world are being influenced by who? All right. He's using them to war against God's people. Make sense? All right. And that's why in Revelation 11, the chapter just before the one we've been reading, is, it says, And the seventh angel sounded... And there were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our God, of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. So they become Christ's, but whose were they before? Okay, Satan's. Thank you. All right. And this is a quote. Uh, it's actually in a Bible commentary. And it says this, Under the symbols of a great red dragon, a leopard-like beast, and a beast with lamb-like horns, the earthly governments which would especially engage in trampling upon God's law and persecuting his people were presented to John. All right. Earthly governments, key point. Not ideology, earthly governments. Keep that in mind. The war is carried till the close of time. The people of God symbolized by a holy woman and her children were represented 
as greatly in the minority, and in the last days only a remnant still existed. Of these, John speaks as they which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. All right. The reason I picked this chapter is because we're in a war. Okay, the Bible paints a picture that we're in a war, and we wrestle not against flesh and blood. And the only way we can stand firm is if we get divine help. And so, like Paul said, in order for us to be fit for the battle, we have to be aware of Satan's strategies. Make sense? A good commander tells his soldiers the battle plan and the enemy's plans so they can know how to fight. All right. Otherwise, Satan will take advantage of us, as you can see. All right. Now, while it is called a war, ultimately the battle is over worship. Because when Satan is using these nations, all right, he's not just trying to destroy people, all right. He wants to get worship. And so here in Isaiah chapter 14, it says, speaking of Lucifer, it says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. All right. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. It speaks of Satan wanting to sit on the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. All right. When you think of congregation, what do you think? Church. I heard church. Who was that whispering? Church, that's it. You think of church. So when it depicts the woman, which is representative of God's church, as being in heaven, all right, that's why. The Bible says in Galatians chapter 4, verse 26, Jerusalem, which is above, is free and is the mother of us all. All right. Because your names are written in heaven. Your strangers on earth. That's why that woman is seen in heaven, all right? Because that's the city that we look to. The same one Abraham looked to. So Satan wants to be like the Most High. So what should we expect from the nations he is using to war against God's people? He wants to use these nations so he can exalt himself to the place of God. So when we look at these nations, we find that in the, the way the nations carry themselves out, the kings of the nations want to bring worship to themselves as God. Why? Because ultimately the worship goes to the devil. Very good. So we get this principle from Revelation 13. In verse 4 it says, They worshipped the dragon. It says, All the world wandered after the beast, and they worshipped the dragon which gave power to the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast who is able to make war with him? So the dragon points people to worship the beast because through worshiping the beast, they worship the dragon. So just like that, with all the nations Satan was going to use in his plan, he would try and turn the worship to them so that it would come to him. Now, at this point, I'm going to ask you to nod if you're following. Okay, good. All right. Now... In the book of Daniel, we're not going to go through this, but I'm going to tell you that in the book of Daniel, the Bible foretells the future of the world, all right, from the time of Babylon right to our day, beyond up to the second coming of Christ. And with the nations detailed, many of them named by name, he goes from Babylon, which is the head of gold, to Persia, arms of silver, brass, Greece, the legs of iron, Rome, and then Rome divides into ten nations. And then basically those mixed clay and iron last until the second coming of Christ, when the rock comes and smashes the image at the feet. Is this prophecy new to anyone? I hope not. Very good. Okay. Now these were notes that were going to be relevant if we had more time. But they're basically detailing what I've just told you of the succession of empires from the Babylonians to the Persians to the Greeks to the Romans 
And so now, after Daniel gives, God gives Nebuchadnezzar the vision of an idol, right? It's an idol with different metals, representing the kingdoms of the world. He then gives the vision to Daniel in a different way, and this time in the form of beasts. Now, what do you think is in common about these beasts? Somebody. What do you see in common? Represent nations. What do you see in common just from what you can see there with no text on it? Sorry? They eat meat. Very good. Actually, it's a good point. Anything else? Okay, very good. Come out of the sea. Very good. Okay. Now, those are the key points, all right? These are ravenous beasts. I'm sure you can tell. You don't want to be anywhere near them. And there's a reason why God gives them to Daniel as ravenous beasts. Because the point is these are the ones that the devil is going to use to war against his people. And in the book of Jeremiah, he actually says they devour his heritage. That's the exact language it uses. So obviously you can understand why, rather than metals, he uses these particular kinds of beasts. So I'm going to read this. Hosea, Hosea was written before Daniel, okay? And so when Daniel wrote his prophecy, a lot of this had already been seeded in the Word of God. All right. Hosea chapter 13 from verse 4 just so we can get a perspective of why he picked those beasts. It says, Yet I am the Lord thy God from the land of Egypt, and thou shalt know no God but me. Okay, giving it context. There's already controversy over worship. The devil wants to steal God's worship. There is no God but me, for there is no Savior besides me. I did know thee in the wilderness, in the land of great drought, according to their pasture. So are they filled they were filled and their heart was exalted. Therefore, they have forgotten me. Therefore, I will be unto them as a lion, as a leopard by the way will I observe them. I will meet them as a bear that is bereaved of her whelps. I will rend the core of their heart and there will I devour them like a lion. The wild beast shall tear them. O Israel, thou hast destroyed thyself but in me is thine help. Okay. God says, I've done it, but in reality, it's not God that has destroyed his people. The people have destroyed themselves by forgetting God, as it says, thou hast forgotten me. And so in forgetting God, God then allows this to come upon them. All right? Okay. Now, the first nation, which was the head of gold and the lion, okay, because we're counting how many on the dragon's head? How many are we counting? Seven. All right. The first one is a lion. Okay. And the lion represents the kingdom of anyone? Babylon. Okay, good. Now, I'm going to read a little bit about Babylon so that we get the context. Right? What are we looking for? Claiming worship, that's what they're going to do. They're going to force you to worship contrary to your conscience. And if you don't, they're going to kill you. Are these devil, dragon-like characteristics? All right, very good. So we start with Babylon, and this is what it says in Daniel chapter 3, the chapter of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. It says, Then a herald cried aloud, To you it is commanded... Back then, it may not have to have gone through parliament, uh, but a commandment was as good as civil legislation. Amen? O people, nations, and languages, that at what time you hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king has set up, and whoso falls not down and worships shall the same hour be cast in the midst of a fiery furnace. What is he doing? Calling for worship to his image, 
right? On pain of death. Dragon-like tactics? Absolutely. Forcing worship to himself. Because he doesn't care how he gets worship. But God doesn't force worship. God wants you to make a conscious, willing decision. It goes on in the next chapter, it says, And the king spake after the king saw a vision of a big tree. The king spake and said, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the king, that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty? While the word was in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven saying, O king Nebuchadnezzar, to thee it is spoken, the kingdom is departed from thee. And they shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. They shall make thee to eat grass as oxen, and seven times, or seven years, shall pass over thee, until thou know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men, and gives it to whomsoever he will. So there's a battle here. The devil is claiming it, and God is saying, I rule. The kingdom of heaven is above all. It is an everlasting kingdom. And that's the conflict. All right. And this is what Jeremiah says. He says, Israel is a scattered sheep. The lions have driven him away. First, the king of Assyria has devoured him. And last, this Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, has broken his bones. Therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will punish king Nebuchadnezzar and, and his land as I have punished the king of Assyria. And in verse 28, it says, The voice of them that flee and escape out of the land of Babylon to declare in Zion the vengeance of the Lord our God, the vengeance of his temple. So this is another aspect. That they not only war against God's people, force, worship, want to be as God themselves, but they also have a controversy with God's temple. They always try and destroy God's temple. So head number one of the dragon, Babylon. Exactly the characteristics we see. Head number two, what was the second beast? Okay, Persia. And Darius was a Persian king. And this is just a snippet to give us the context of the qualities that are conveyed. It says, it pleased Darius to set over the kingdom a hundred and twenty princes which should be over the whole kingdom... And over these three presidents, of whom Daniel was first, that the princes might give accounts unto them, and the king should have no damage. Then this Daniel was preferred above the presidents and princes, because an excellent spirit was in him, and the king thought to set him over the whole realm. Then the presidents and princes sought to find occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could find none occasion nor fault, for as much as he was Faithful, amen to that. Neither was there any error or fault found in him. Then said these men, now I read that because the Bible speaks in Revelation about 144,000. It says, there is no guile found in their mouth. They follow the lamb whithersoever he goes. And those are the ones, those are the kind of people the devil wants to war against. Then said these men, we shall find no occasion against Daniel, except we find it against him concerning the law of his God. There we go now, trying to violate your conscience, forcing you to violate your conscience. Then these presidents and princes assembled together to the king and said thus to him, King, live forever. All the presidents of the kingdom, the governors and the princes, the counselors and the captains have consulted together to establish a royal statute. In the other one, it was a commandment. It's a royal statute. Does it change from being civil legislation? It's the same context, isn't it? Where civil legislation is passed to force God's people to worship contrary to what God requires of them. And that's exactly why it says the devil is only warring against those that keep the commandments of God. So then it goes on and... It says there, Now, O king, establish the decree and sign the writing that it be not changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, Persians which alters not. Wherefore, King Darius signed the writing and the decree. Okay, so it goes on. 
and on, talking about then Daniel ended up having to be thrown into the lion's den. All right? So I hope you're seeing the same principle here of the devil's tactic. That starting with Babylon, he would try and force people so that he can receive worship. Through exalting a man so that people would worship the man and he gets the worship in turn. All right. After, we've counted only two heads. We've got seven, five to go. Okay. I'm not going to do all seven. I'm going to do only up to six. And then the next one will be done in a separate study. So then you have the leopard, right? That's the other nation the devil chooses. And I thought I will get a snippet. And if you Google this, it's all over the internet. Okay, this was a, a Greek king. And he's, the name he chose, this wasn't his actual name, okay? The name he chose was God Manifest. Okay, sounds like the devil, right? I will be like the Most High. And um, it speaks about where he reigned. And it says, as a ruler, he was best known for his encouragement of Greek culture and institutions. His attempts to suppress Judaism brought on the wars of the Maccabees. Antiochus's Hellenizing policies brought him into conflict with the prosperous Oriental temple organizations, and particularly with the Jews. Since Antiochus III's reign, the Jews had enjoyed extreme autonomy, extensive autonomy under their high priest. When Antiochus returned from Egypt in 167, he took Jerusalem by storm and enforced its Hellenization. The city forfeited its privileges and was permanently garrisoned by Syrian soldiers. The Greek and those friendly toward them were united into the community of Antiochians. The worship of Yahweh and all the Jewish rites were forbidden on pain of death. In the temple, an altar to Zeus Olympius was erected and sacrifices were to be made at the feet of an idol in the image of the king. Okay, same principle. Issue with God's temple, forcing God's people to worship and civil legislation to do so if he can't get his way. And he made people worship a man. Three heads, fourth head, Roman Empire. I'm going to speed through these, all right, so we can get to the point. Fourth empire, the fourth head of the dragon in Revelation 12 was the Roman Empire. Okay. And how do we know? In Matthew chapter 2, we know of Herod's decree to kill all the babies, right? Because he was trying to get who? He was trying to kill Jesus, all right? And so for those that are taking notes, um, this is only one that speaks of Herod. It says in Acts chapter 4, the kings of the earth stood up and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For of a truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together for to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word. Foreheads, same principle. It says in Acts chapter 12, now about, the now about that time Herod the king stretched forth his hand to vex certain of the church. And he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And because he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. It goes on in that same chapter, it says, And upon a said day, because I want you to see how each one of these kings exalts themselves as God and forces worship, okay? And they forbid God's people from worshiping the way they feel convicted to worship. It says this in the same chapter, chapter 12. It says, Upon a set day, Herod, arrayed in royal apparel, sat upon his throne and made an oration unto them. And the people gave a shout, saying, It is the voice of a, of a God and not of a man. And immediately the angel of the Lord smote him because he gave not God the glory and he was eaten by worms and died. 
It's a repeating cycle, exactly the same. Fourth head of the dragon. Now the, okay, that's another one talking about the same thing where it says that these men being Jews do exceedingly trouble our city and teach customs which are not lawful. Now when it says the customs are not lawful, what does that mean? It's against the law to practice religion according to your conscience. All right. Four heads of the dragon. The fifth head, I'm going to have to tell you this. Okay. The fifth head is represented as a little horn in the book of Daniel. He wars against God's people for 1,260 years. He thinks to change God's times and laws. And he speaks great words against the Most High. For those of you that didn't know, I'm going to say this, okay? The fifth head of the dragon, because we read that there are civil governments, it is not just papacy, right? The papacy is not a civil government. It was the papacy supported by those kings. Does that make sense? When it, the papacy was supported by the kings of Europe, then they enforced, because the papacy can't enforce civil legislation in Europe. I hope that makes sense. So the beast is actually not just the papacy. It is when it is supported by the civil powers of Europe. That's why the Bible paints that picture. Just like the Jews had the Romans to back them up to persecute God's people. All right. And so when you get to Revelation, it paints that little horn supported by those kings as a beast of its own. So that's where we get the fifth beast. The fifth beast is the leopard-like beast of Revelation 13 who has seven heads, ten horns, and ten crowns upon his horns because the crowns have shifted. So the power is with the kings that are giving power to the papacy. That's five heads of the dragon. And speaking of that fifth head, it says, Paul says this, Now we beseech you therefore, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that you be not soon shaken in mind, neither troubled by spirit nor by word, or by letter as from us, as the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day will not come except they come a falling away first, and the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or is worshipped, so that he as God sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Same principle as with the previous kings, where he gets worship to himself as God. Fifth head. And it speaks of him as coming after the working of Satan. So it pays direct tribute to Satan for his coming. I was going to say something else about when it says, with all lying signs and wonders. Because those signs and wonders are performed by the beast that comes out of the earth. All right. Now, here's the summary I've used my time up. Here's the summary, okay? It's only been half an hour. The summary is this. We have had five heads of the dragon established from the Bible. And when we first read that verse, it says five have fallen. And this fifth one, it says received a deadly wound. The Bible calls the fifth beast Babylon. And what does it say of Babylon? Babylon has fallen, has fallen. How many times? Twice. So when Babylon falls, that's the fifth head fallen. The fifth kingdom fallen. Make sense? Five are fallen. And they're not just any five. They're five kingdoms that the devil has used not only to exalt man to receive worship so that he gets it, but also to enforce worship upon God's people contrary to what God requires. 
And we know that through the dark ages, because that fifth beast changed God's times and laws, legislation after legislation followed enforcing people not only to break the Sabbath, but to do all the other rites and customs that the papacy practices. Now, you can look this up on any history book. Now, I want to say this, okay? The Bible emphasizes the time of that fifth head. It repeats the time that it reigns through different chapters in Daniel and in Revelation, I think about six times. Now, I'll tell you why it repeats it over and over and over and over again. Because after the woman was carried into the wilderness, that period of the wilderness, that's when it speaks of the devil as having a short time. If you read in Revelation 12, it says he has a short time. So after that period, he was going to come with fury because his time was short. Now, if you have read any book on prophecy, after the fifth head was wounded in 1798, when Napoleon's general Berthia marched into Rome and arrested the Pope and took him captive, after that, that's when the time of the end began. And I want you to read this verse here, and I'm going to zone in on the end part of it. It says, and, an, and the angel which I saw standing upon the sea and upon the earth lifted up his hand to heaven and swear by him that lives forever and ever who created heaven and the things that therein are, the earth and the things that are therein, and the sea and the things that are therein, that there should be time no longer. After the fifth head was wounded, the dragon knew, I have a short time. The time of the end began. If you know about the last days, that's when we officially were in the last days. So when it says time no longer, if you've got a different translation, do you know what it says? It says there should be delay no longer. So from this point on, the contractions of the woman in labor leading up to the second coming of Christ would begin. And so there would be no more delay, no more turning back, no more prolonging. And this is what it says. Time no longer. I don't know if I put the next verse. Okay. Now, when it says time no longer, if you think about the context, in Revelation 14, it says, I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to them that dwell upon the earth, saying, fear God, give glory to him. Why? Because there is time no longer. If you read the last verse in this chapter, it uses those exact words to preach to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. So when it uses that in Revelation 14 saying, the hour of his judgment has come, it is saying, this is it. This is the final phase of earth's history. Once the papacy had gone, we would have America reigning as the next beast. And we know that the beast that arises out of the earth reigns right until the second coming. How do we know? Because he partakes in the enforcing of the mark of the beast. But he is only the sixth head of the dragon. The dragon has seven heads. And so after America, there is another head of the dragon, which is depicted in Revelation 17. And we're going to dig into this next week. But this was the point I was going to make. If you look at the history of the strategy the devil has used, and if you look at the nations outlined, we have America still the world superpower. Has it began to do the things that are said that the nations used by the dragon do? It kind of has, but has it really? Not really. Has it started to enforce worship upon God's people? No. Can we be certain that it will happen? Absolutely. But not just America 
you have the next head of the dragon, and you'll find out about that next week. And so here is my exhortation to you. And it is in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 11. Now, as you're turning there, the Bible says that in the last days, scoffers will come. There is nothing that paralyzes God's church in our day, such as fear of being mocked, of being ridiculed, fear of looking like a fool. And that is how the devil has worked to quench the voice of God's people. And this is what we should learn from the accounts of people like Esther, like Daniel, like Paul, like Christ. And it's in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 11. It says, now all these things happen to them for examples. They were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. So why were those accounts written? For us who are going to face the exact same thing. Civil legislation forcing us to worship God contrary to the dictates of our conscience. A man standing up, taking the place of God and wanting worship on pain of death. Now, if you think these are just words And, oh, I'll deal with it when it comes. I want you to think of the fact that if you look through all these accounts, in Mordecai's time, how many people stood up and didn't bow down in a worshipful sense to Haman? One. In Daniel's day, in the day of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, how many people stood up against the decree of the king? When Daniel was thrown in the lion's den, how many stood up in the realm of Persia saying, I'm going to worship God according to my conscience? How many? One. Now count those numbers and think about the exact same trial coming upon us in the last days. What can we learn? That it is a difficult task to stand up for God in the face of death. It really is. And so God is saying to us to take a lesson out of Daniel's book. Take a lesson out of Esther's book, out of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's book. Because what is written will surely come to pass because there shall be time no longer, no more delay. If you ever thought about taking your relationship with God seriously, this is the time. And so I'm going to say to you, people of God, and those people that really understand the things that are coming upon us, that it is not a joke. It is actually very, very serious. It says even among ourselves we'll turn against each other. And so we're going to, for those that really want to make a stand, to make a stand for God, and I I really, really... Um, praise God for what you've done, Samuel, what God has done through you guys at your school, standing up in the face of ridicule in a school of how many people? Okay. How many people attended? Okay. Can you see the numbers? And I can guarantee you there's lots of Christians at that school. Very few people are willing, when the rubber hits the road, to stand for God. And so I'm compelling you as God's people to take it as seriously as you possibly can. If you are serious with God, he says, he will not allow you to be tempted above what you can handle. But it takes serious, deep pleading with God, following the truth as you know how to, and standing for God in the day-to-day things that we are challenged with, like with the... uh, story that we heard from Sonia. So if you're here, think about the implications. You don't have to stand up 
But if you're here and you really see the implications of the future, that there will be civil legislation against God's people, and you want to take a stand for God now, I'm going to ask you to stand up. Don't feel pressured by the crowd. Stand up if you really mean it. If you really mean it, I want you to stand up and we're going to pray. Because every decision you make counts. God says, them them that honor me, I will honor. And so the battle really is the Lord's. And all we're doing is making a decision to say, Lord, I'm going to stand by you. So if you're here, make a stand. All right. Amen. Amen for that. I want you to know that God honors your decision because the angels are watching. And He knows that we are but flesh. But He honors your decision because your decision right now, the adversary of souls, the dragon with seven heads, is watching and is about to make war with you. And He will make war with you even on your own. Be sure of it. And God is calling us like Daniel to stand with him. And all the host of heaven will be on our side. Even if you're left one man in White Tag Church. One person. Let us close our eyes and we will pray. Father in heaven, we do not boast of anything that we have or anything that we know, O oh Lord. But we humble ourselves, Lord, in deep humility and contrition, realizing how serious the times ahead are. The Bible says that men had to stand in flaming fire. Others were tormented, afflicted, not accepting deliverance because they looked to that city which had foundations whose builder and maker is God. Father, our salvation is assured in Christ. And Father, we are thirsting right now for your spirit. While we are feeble, to give us the power, Lord, to speak the word of God with boldness. And Lord, as we speak, we know that though our outward man perish, our inward man will be strengthened to face the battle ahead. Like Daniel, like Shadrach, and Meshach, and Abednego, like Mordecai. Father, we pray your spirit, Lord, may rain down upon us to give us strength. Inside, Lord, our fears, outside fightings. Within us, Lord, we cannot withstand the fight. And so, Lord, we are calling upon you that in our weakness, make us strong. For your strength is made perfect in weakness. We are willing, O Lord, and that's all we can offer you, a willing heart this morning. Father, we pray that you may accept this and take us and use us as soldiers for your kingdom in these last days. I pray your blessing upon everyone that has taken a stand, that you may protect them and encamp around them with the angel of the Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. You may remain standing so we can sing our final hymn. And God bless you for taking a stand. It means... A lot in the eyes of God and in the eyes of all the angels that are going to stand in your defense in the last days. We're going to sing our last hymn. Live out thy life within me.